Lakshma. I'm the director of Create, um, which is the one of the five hubs funded by the HRC, and it's jointly funded by the HRC, EPSRC, and ESRC, and it's the only one which has this kind of interdisciplinary shape from the start. And it's a research center in a more classical sense, in that it's not a, um, we, we produce substantive work, not only knowledge exchange, though knowledge exchange is built into everything we do. Uh, Create in, involves, involves seven universities, 80 academics, and 40 projects. It's a major, major interdisciplinary effort drawing an expertise in law, economics, management, computer science, sociology, psychology, ethnography, and critical studies. And it's globally for the first time that resources have been committed to investigate the role of copyright law at the digital center of the creative industries. We launched a year ago, and our research program is now in full flow. And if you visit our stand outside, on the right side, you, there are some first results of, of three and four projects, um, and we would be available for conversation later in the day. So I would like to show you a couple of sites um, where you can see some of the projects we demonstrate outside in more detail. So if you can move over back to the website, please. Okay. So, copyright law, till fairly recently, was a discourse between experts. But if we look um, at the current political um, context, the European Commission consultation, which um, closed last week, attracted more than 10,000 responses. The, the consultation before that attracted 160. So the, the context of copyright has completely changed. And in the UK specifically, we've got the Hargreaves reforms, which are before Parliament at the moment. And again, there's intense lobbying, and it has been going on for, for three years. So in this kind of contested space to produce an, a, a, a research center which focuses on independent evidence is, is a challenge. And one of the ways we address this is by um, being extremely open about the design of our methodologies and our research designs. And we demonstrate our interactions in the, in the design of our research on our website where you can at any time check the process through which we went for each of our projects. So one of the projects where we have made considerable progress is the um, archives and copyright project. So archives and copyright um, memory institutions uh, is an important part of, of uh, the UK cultural framework. So there are um, more than 3,000 archives and many, many libraries and trust archives. And um, the material which they hold is largely protected by copyright law, but by right holders which are unknown. So they cannot be easily made available in, in an online context. So one of our major first studies is investigating the process by which these materials could be made online. And we have worked closely with the Welcome uh, Library Project Code Breakers. Um, which uh, has put two million items online relating to the history of genetics. And uh, we find that a risk-based approach which assesses the risks of making the material available um, it seems to have produced a, a, um, an outcome of access to these materials which would have been difficult to achieve if one had followed a, the traditional process. So the risk, risk management process, again, is demonstrated in, in, in resources we are developing, which you can uh, have a look at uh, outside if you would like to. The second uh, resource I would like to flag up briefly is the copyright user portal. 
So the Copyright User Portal is a resource which aims to address questions which media professionals, um, users, and creators have. So we generated from frequently asked, asked questions on, on the web uh, a landscape of the real world problems creators and users face and generated resources which reflect those issues. So we, we have interviews which put those questions into a shape and then authoritative answers um, to it. So if you go to that website and it's available outside, there, um, it, again, I would encourage you just to try it out and see um, where you go. The last one I would like to show is um, a study which we will launch in at Stationers Hall in, uh, on the 11th of um, April. And that is a behavioral economics study from, from our partners at the U University of East Anglia. And um, this is a systematic review of all empirical studies relating to file sharing and un unauthorized use of copyright works. Um, so they started with a, a, a technique of, of meta-analysis we know from pharmaceutical uh, studies. So they distilled as a 50,000 items identified through a systematic review down to 250 and then analyzed them by sector and by method. And the results of that study, which is one of our most, first major empirical um, efforts, uh, will be launched um, on the 11th of April. Again, I would just encourage you to explore that. Okay, I think that's enough as a, as a kind of pitch of where we are. We are at the end of the first year. We have got uh, three or four studies where we have, I think, important uh, findings which bear on the space um, you all work in. And I would encourage you to engage with those. Um, and now we hand over to uh, Philip Schlesinger um, and his team um, to explore knowledge exchange in practice in an associated project at the University of Glasgow. Philip. Well, th <coughs> thank you very Philip. much, Martin. PowerPoint. Um, I'm Philip Schlesinger. I'm uh, a deputy director of CREATE, and I also work in the Centre for Cultural Policy Research at the University of Glasgow. And in this breakout session, we'd like to give you um, an overview of a one-year creative economy knowledge exchange project. And our object of study has been an organization called Cultural Enterprise Office, which is based in Glasgow. And you'll hear more about that in a minute. Uh, but before we move on, let me ask my colleagues to introduce themselves. Um, I'm Dr. Naomi Self, and I'm uh, also a researcher and lecturer in the Centre for Cultural Policy Research in Glasgow. Um, I'm Dr. Yasich Munro, and I'm the project researcher on the Supporting Creative Business project. Um, once we've been through the brief discussion of the project, we're going to be in conversation with Deborah here. Deborah, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Deborah Keogh. I'm the director of Cultural Enterprise Office in Glasgow, and we're a business support specialist service for creative micro businesses and freelancers, um, funded by Scottish Government and Creative Scotland. Well, let me just tell you a bit about the project. Um, start off by saying that uh, in you know, what is quite a long career now of uh, doing ethnographic research uh, and research into organizations, I, I would say we've had really quite exceptional access to cultural enterprise office. Um, really, nothing has been withheld. We've been able to talk to whomever we wish to. Uh, we've had all the documentation we wanted. We've been able to attend meetings. And um, I think as an example of how things can be opened up, this is really rather extraordinary, and I'd like to say, you know, for the record, that we do applaud uh, CEOs' openness and also uh, its willingness to take the risk of being researched. Um, second point, really, is that the project, in some respects, has been co-produced with CEO. Uh, obviously, we set up the academic framework, but in terms of identifying the issues that we needed to talk about and 
thinking about the issues that we wanted to address. Um, those were run uh, through with CEO when we put our research proposal together. And of course, like any piece of research, this has evolved. And uh, not everything we thought we were going to do has actually come about, and new things have emerged. Uh, but once again, in terms of actually setting up a project, uh, this has been um, an unusual kind of experience. Um, the work has been done through ethnographic teamwork. Um, as this is the team here. Uh, we've divided the labor in a variety of ways. And uh, we think, actually, that um, the, the, the particular way in which our team has been put together in terms of career stage, in terms of uh, gender diversity, uh, has been really, really important for the success of gathering uh, information and developing relationships uh, with CEO. And, and it, there's no doubt that in projects of this kind, uh, developing and maintaining relationships and operating within a framework of trust is rather key. Um, a word about knowledge exchange, because that is, uh, if you like, the mantra of the moment. Um, we went in uh, expecting to do certain things, and we have indeed done them. We uh, set up several formal meetings uh, in which we fed back to the uh, CEO staff what we had been learning at various stages of our research, and uh, they responded. And we, we held these as uh, seminars, in a sense, um, in which we presented material and in which um, we were interrogated and indeed put right uh, at various points. Now, that's the formal aspect of knowledge exchange and perhaps the bit that's most familiar. But we also found that as we were doing the study, there was a, uh, a set of informal practices that evolved, and that was because of the nature of the kinds of conversations that we were having with the staff of the organization. Um, I, for example, attended board meetings. Um, Melanie and Jalicic can tell you about uh, aspects of their own practice. Uh, but we, we found that in the, in the process of conversation, in the process of raising questions, just as part of everyday practice, away from any sort of formal set of goals, uh, some kind of process of transformation was taking place. And we'll pick up on that later uh, when we talk to Deborah. Uh, let me now turn to the, uh, to the Scottish context. I, I think there must be hardly anyone in the world who does not know that there is um, uh, a referendum on independence uh, coming up in Scotland on the 18th of September. Um, the Scottish uh, support landscape is really quite distinctive. It, it has very many features in common with other parts of the UK, but it also has its own dynamic and its own shape. Um, one of the things that has been very striking about the way in which Scotland has evolved, particularly in terms of thinking about the creative industries and uh, latterly what, we, what everyone now seems to call the creative economy, has been the way in which uh, ideas first developed uh, in London under New Labour uh, post-1997 uh, were taken up uh, into, the de into the devolution process itself. So when cultural policy was being developed in Scotland, um, the, the, the uh, coalition government of the time had picked up new Labour thinking. And uh, it would be true to say that the Scottish National Party government has continued with this focus. But latterly, uh, and uh, as we get nearer to the referendum, increasingly perhaps uh, emphasised uh, the distinctiveness of so-called uh, Scottish values. Um, there is a way in which culture uh, is not to the forefront of the referendum campaign, but it is nonetheless um, becoming uh, increasingly significant as a focus uh, in, in that campaign. We'd like to now just turn to um, identify some of the tensions that there are between um, if you like, UK and Scottish government perspectives, which, which actually play their way into the whole field of um, the uh, creative support landscape and indeed into thinking about the creative economy generally in Scotland. Um, a good way of doing this is just to take 
three set piece speeches uh, which have been made over the past year uh, that were delivered by the Scottish and UK secretaries for culture. Um, Maria Miller, the uh, UK culture secretary uh, at the British Museum, which is of course a central institution of Britishness, uh, talked about fighting culture's corner in an age of austerity. This was almost a year ago now and uh, emphasized the centrality of culture to economic growth, which I think was very much the message that was uh, coming across from the podium uh, this morning. And uh, talked about the public funding of the arts as venture capital, which would, would actually was a phrase that had been used by the prior Labour government. Uh, well, in a very direct response to this, Fiona Hislop, who is the uh, culture secretary in the Scottish government, at the University of Edinburgh talked about culture and heritage in an independent Scotland and laid emphasis on creating the conditions for artists to flourish and described culture as the heart, soul and essence of the nation and put quality of life questions before the economy. And this is obviously part of a political struggle that's going on at the moment between uh, the governments north and south of the border. And then the third example is that of Maria Miller again speaking at the British Library and perhaps as a response to critics south of the border rather than directly addressing the Scottish government. Uh, she emphasized now in a softer vein how British culture is central to national identity, uh, emphasized the UK's soft power and how the economic dimension of culture is just one thing, talking uh, feelingly of how poetry, theater, and the, the opera tug the heartstrings. So, um, of course, coming out of that, once again, uh, there's a stress on how culture is related to the creative industry. So we, we are in this, we, we can note this kind of tension between the uh, the two governments, how they're setting, setting out their stalls, uh, but that there's a continual oscillation, if you like, between cultural value on the one hand and economic value on the other. Thanks. Um, right, I'm going to try and give you a sort of a potted history or a little bit of a sketch of uh, the development of CEO before handing over to Yalisic, who's going to talk about some of the, the current ethnographic work. Uh, and I think that's useful because one of the things that we found uh, as, as we've been working is the way in which the organization has developed has been very much shaped and framed in relation to the, um, the world it finds itself within. So CEO have never really had a continuous source of funding, but they have managed to continuously operate in what is a very precarious sector, the cultural support sector, for 12 years. Um, one of the things we've tried to work out within the project is how the organization has managed to make and remake a place for itself within what has emerged to be, uh, I would say, a multiply layered and multiply shifting policy landscape. Uh, I feel that what we've discovered is that in order to keep doing what they do, to deliver and develop business support that's relevant to the creative sector clients that Deborah outlined, particularly clients with micro-business needs and freelance needs, CEO has had to keep on changing and adapting itself, taking and making its own opportunities, finding new sources of funding, and developing new models of operation in many ways behaving like a very kind of agile little small business. Um, and I think this has also shaped the way that they see their relationship with their clients. So across the organization, particularly for the staff on the front line of advising and, and sort of delivering information and support, the very real precariousness of the organization creates a sense of fellow feeling with the client base. So CEO situation kind of echoes that of the clients. Um, and this is also, I think, reinforced by the fact that many of CEO staff have past or ongoing experience as creative practitioners themselves. They're often trying to balance the work they do in their day job with their creative practice, which is similar uh, to the kind of portfolio management of, of a career that their clients do. So there is this deeply felt sense within CEO that we've all kind of picked up on that, that we are our clients is kind of a strand that comes through for us. 
Now, in terms of what we've got on the um, display here, the current framing, I think, stresses both, so that bottom quote, Scotland Specialist Business Support and Development Service for Creative and Cultural Businesses and Individuals, uh, stresses both the support for um, emerging and established businesses in the sector. But this has been uh, something that's kind of come through as, as a process of development. So if you think back to the points of origin of the organization, um, there are a number of contexts we have to bear in mind. And this is not just the new labor creative turn and uh, 1999's devolution, which I think Philip has touched on, but also uh, the city of Glasgow's desire to consolidate its post-1990 city of culture status as a center for creativity. Um, although CEO didn't open up until 2002, its emphasis came a little earlier in 1999, and it was a result of a collaboration between what was then the nationwide arts body, body the Scottish Arts Council, and Scottish Enterprise Glasgow, which was the city's division of Scotland's main economic and investment agency. So quite a striking feature for us of the initial remit was to support sole arts practitioners and cultural micro-businesses. This is a very overlooked area where much of the thinking about SMEs is for larger organizations. Um, but also in terms of its focus on arts practitioners rather than the more commercially orientated creative industries, which I think you have come to embrace more and more over time, Deborah. Um, moreover, I think it was aimed at those at a very early career stage of development, partly because they were seen as being a hole in provision there. Um, but this remit was also crafted in relation both to that perceived need within the sector, but also with an eye to not stepping on toes in relation to what was already provided in terms of existing business support provision delivered by other agencies. As a new entrant coming into a publicly funded field, CEO needed to both show its distinctive contribution and to be seen as not duplicating existing services. And I think particularly for the key Scottish uh, enterprise funder in the initial instance, CEO was one more specialist element within a, a wider business support spectrum that it had its hand in. So in terms of scope and scale, small beginnings, team of three, soon uh, often two at one point, who were concentrated on developing what remains very much a core offer. An information service, a, a range of training events, many delivered in partnership and developed in partnership with other bodies, uh, for instance, higher education institutions and professional bodies and a coaching-centered approach to delivering one-to-one -one advice sessions that are very kind of holistic in their approach to the creative individual's needs. The next phase of operation, and the, the phases tend to tie in with funding phases, uh, was about aiming for a more national coverage in 2004. And this followed an, a kind of a positive report on the first phase. So CEO secured three-year funding to roll out its services to major Scottish cities beyond Glasgow. Uh, a hub-and-spoke model was adopted with Glasgow as the head office, but offices also in Edinburgh, in Dundee, and in Aberdeen. Um, and in terms of occupying a distinctive place in the sector, the emphasis is very much on pre-startup business phase. But I think this is also an interesting point where we start to see in the language uh, of the documentation, something which I remember kind of very strikingly you coming out with when we first encountered you back in 2012 and started these discussions, that this was a translation service, that this was about translating the language of uh, business into something that was uh, meaningful to arts practitioners. And, and how to put that know-how into the right register to really kind of connect with that audience. Um, I'm just gonna hop across to the next slide and show a little diagram here. So in this phase, we can see um, that from a kind of an office of three, uh, we perhaps have something which is a bit wider reaching. There are now uh, these general advisors based in different cities, but there's also beyond them a spectrum of specialist advisors who have expertise in particular business skills and in particular creative practice areas. Um, and if we look at what's going on in the office, uh, in, in the hub, there's also a series of uh, projects. Uh, there's a project team. And I'll speak a little bit more about what's going on there. And there's the information team as well. So um, while the, the organization has had a bit of a restructure in the year we've been studying them, I think uh, these functions are all still there intact within the organization. Um, 
So in this phase, you know, there's a real expansion in the breadth and reach of the services delivered and an attempt to really kind of meet other needs that are perceived within the sector. And these cover things like networking, peer support programs, uh, professional development planning, which I think is really interesting because it expressly extended the offer beyond that kind of initial focus on early stage and pre-startup to more of a kind of career-centered approach inviting people to come in, take stock at any stage, and plan their long-term goals and their next move. So that's more of a kind of the shift towards the, the, the long-term career. Um, and I think we also need to see that as a strategic shift, so here we've got the map, um, the aim to reach beyond the metropolitan centers. So then... I'm assuming here that everybody knows where Glasgow is and over where Edinburgh is. Um, but you also have uh, Dundee and... Uh, I'm not very accurate with this behind my head. And Aberdeen sort of up here. Um, the, the, the strategic shift, I think, to reach beyond metropolitan centres was very in tune at the time with wider policy thinking, um, which was increasingly turning to regional and rural development. But in, it, you can see from the, the numbers of who they're serving on the, on the screen that it was kind of only a partial success in some ways. Um, Aberdeen remained difficult to crack, partly because there was a sort of tension between the needs of the city, who put money into the pot, and the shire, uh, where most of the creatives seemed to be located. Um, the Highlands and Islands was very much a, a world apart with its own support structures, and the, those were kind of long established. So there's a sort of an internal Scottish politics of, of how you move around within the country that, that I think made it difficult to just kind of move outwards. Um, and also if we nip back over to the, the project section here, um, this is a phase really uh, where projects and programs became increasingly important. There was a change in funding in 2009 from EU-based money via uh, Scottish Enterprise to Scottish Government support. And this area really sort of became a, a growth area. So CEO was involved in developing, supporting and delivering um, the what had initially been a Nesta program, Starter for Six, which is a competitive scheme for innovative new businesses, providing training and uh, awarding business and development development funding to successful participants. Uh, it now also has Fashion Foundry, which is a fashion business incubator, a Flourish, uh, which is a mentoring scheme um, running through a program like Starter for Six, but designed for more established businesses, those that have been trading for over two years. And so there's a sort of a range of different um, standalone programs, which although they draw on the skills and the um, experience and the techniques of the wider organization, also have their own um, key performance indicators, their own um, agendas that need to be delivered on and uh, sort of evidence to the funders responsible for those particular pots of money. So that in some ways complicates the role of the organization. If we nip back to the other slide here, um, in terms of the present day, uh, we, we encounter cultural enterprise offices at a moment where it's trying to rethink the way in which it reaches into the Scottish regions through a kind of cascade-based uh, partnership scheme with uh, local councils. Um, and will this be a, perhaps a, a more, more sort of expansive way of reaching uh, beyond Glasgow and beyond the city centres uh, than, than working through other city sites? Um, and I think it also, it, you know, that it, it's also clearly working hard to uh, restructure itself in a way that is more flexible, that allows that nimbleness to be enabled. Um, so the organisation is, is trying to work in, 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 through, through a new podular system uh, that they've implemented, partly because they are aware of the fact that they are doing so many things and they need to enable staff to do that. Um, so I'm going to hand on to Jalicic now, but I think one of the things that we have found is that doing many, many things and trying to keep hold of your core values of, of supporting the creative individual and keeping the individual at heart um, can be quite tricky in many respects because you have a sort of top-down model of uh, what, what a, a business development should be and a ground-up, bottom-up knowledge of what your creative sector clients are facing in terms of challenges 
and in terms of complexity. Um, so I'm going to pass on to Jalicic, and she's going to say a bit now about how the client-facing staff manage these uh, conflicting uh, agendas, both the sort of top-down policy agendas and their kind of real-world knowledge of the field. Thanks, Matt. I think we need one more. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so just... Uh, I guess I'm going to flesh out a little on, on what Mel's, um, Mel's just said uh, by talking a little more about the interviews that we've done with um, CEO staff and with CEO clients. Um, and so one of the things that comes through really strongly from the interviews we've done with CEO clients is how much they value those face-to-face -face interactions that form a key part of CEO service. So Mel mentioned one-to-one um, -one advice. Of course, this is you know, really important to the client base. Um, there's regional advisors based in three of Scotland's major cities and specialist advisors from across Scotland providing advice on an as-and-when kind of basis. And obviously, as Mel said, CEO also has a, a team of dedicated staff manning the phones in the office, and these staff can point clients towards information and resources, you know, on an as-and-when basis as well. And so the client-facing staff are very much valued by CEO clients both personally in that some clients form quite close relationships with trusted members of staff who know them and know the progress of their business, um, and professionally in that CEO staff are seen as able to help with many of the problems that uh, clients are liable to encounter. And the, like, one thing that's come um, out of the research that we've done is, is the extent to which the relationship between client-facing staff um, and CEO clients, is a, is, it's a key facet, yes, of CEO's offer, you know, of their uh, portfolio of support. Um, but it's also an expression of their organizational values, that, uh, and these have been held pretty much constant uh, since the organization was set up. And due to the nature of their position, uh, these client-facing staff have an ear to the ground, so they're very finely attuned uh, to the issues affecting the creative sector and individuals and businesses within the sector. But they are located in a really difficult position that involves really careful management. So the staff have to balance their responsibilities to CEO and to CEO's key performance indicators, KPIs, um, which in turn represent one of the measures by which Scottish Government, via Creative Scotland, um, decides how, when and what to fund the CEO with what they're picking up from the clients, like what the CEO clients need. And so... CEO's core funding is um, reliant on contributing to the growth of the creative economy in Scotland, but of course a purely economic approach to growth is antithetical to their core values and many of the, the core values of, of their clients as well. Um, and as Philip mentioned, recent months have uh, seen a shift in rhetoric from Fiona Hislop, our Secretary for Culture and External Affairs, and um, Creative Scotland, our major funding body, away from a purely economic approach um, to culture and creative value, which is, of course, in stark contrast to what's coming out of Westminster. Um, but when it comes to, to measures of success, of course, uh, the Scottish Government um, economic measures are still in vogue uh, at Holyrood as well. Um, but, of course, a large body of grey and academic literature has grown up around um, the idea that the creative sector is a place where many... Um, sort of different and complementary ideas about value come together. And so many of the CEO clients that I spoke to really relished um, the way in which the creative sector accommodates all kinds of alternative economies, so gift exchanges, skill swaps, um, informal economic arrangements, that's in scare quotes, um, and so on and so forth. So for many clients, that's how they get by in the sector, and they're kind of unsure as to whether or not that's being properly recognised by those in positions of authority. And so CEO know via the very close relationship that they cultivate with their clients that when it comes to measuring the success, um, you know, their own success and the success of the creative sector, that the useful unit is probably the creative individual. And yet they're consistently forced to measure using the unit of the creative business. And so the creative individual can be associated with um, many creative businesses and many creative projects as well. And businesses, of course, as we all know, grow and contract and occasionally they fail or, or kind of are put on hiatus. And projects come and go, but the creative individual is still the driver. And 
you know, CEOs, client-facing staff know that individuals in the sector go beyond the business and that there are many ways in which a creative individual can be successful and the economic contribution um, or growth of their business is only one of them. And so from the interviews that we've done with the clients, we're starting to see, you know, in a very real way, um, the variety of other measures of success uh, that the clients take into consideration when thinking about their careers. So these might be about growth, funding, financial, financial security, of course, but equally they might be about job satisfaction, they might be about networks and partnerships, they might be about using their skills, especially if people have made a great investment in those skills. Um, they might be about confidence or just general well-being as well. But of course, um, one of the themes that emerges very strongly from the data we've collected as well is the sense of precarity that many individuals feel as they attempt to make a living in the sector. And of course, this finding draws our work very much in line with some of the recent academic literature on creative labour, which highlights the precariousness of employment in the creative industries, the uncertainty of income, the low wages, and the expectation or increasingly the requirement that people will work for free in order to keep doing what they love, which eventually obviously becomes a very dangerous um, kind of pattern. And so as Mel said, many um, individuals, creative individuals have these portfolio lives, careers that are made up of a series of part-time, uh, short-term jobs or projects that require incredibly careful management. Um, and precarity appears to be a condition that affects many of the clients that we've spoken to um, who you know, have interactions with CEO. Even some of the more established individuals and creative businesses that we spoke to were financially precarious, certainly. And paradoxically almost, in some ways, often the more established and well-regarded a creative individual or business is, the more likely its precarity is to go unnoticed because they fill a gap, you know, they're well used. People know, know the name of the individual or the business. Um, and so because clients are liable to keep their business going um, at all costs, working for nothing, working at extra hours and so on, you know, the, the financial precarity of that business is, is not necessarily recognized by those in uh, positions of influence. And a related point that came out of a lot of the data that we collected is that neither age nor career stage were markers of security uh, amongst the clients that we spoke to. And so the interviews that we've done really point to the need to ensure that businesses in the creative sector have suitable business models um, such that they're you know, resilient against those changes in the economic, uh, political and cultural landscape. And as Philip mentioned before, um, the complexity of the support landscape also emerged as a problem for clients, for the, the Scottish-based clients. Um, many of those that we interviewed were unsure of how a CEO fit together with Creative Scotland, um, with other organisations such as Business Gateway, Scottish Enterprise, and so on. So that was an, an added kind of point of confusion. And a related issue, of course, um, is that clients still found negotiating a relationship with Creative Scotland, the major funder, um, a, a very fraught experience. And what I guess is distinctive about that is that, you know, over the last couple of years, the funding landscape in Scotland has changed quite a bit and there's, there have been concerted attempts to streamline the process, um, you know, to build a new funding body that's more uh, adaptable and kind of more in tune with what, um, with what creative individuals need. But this work that we've done kind of shows that there are still very much gaps and failures in service provision. So over to Philip to wrap up. Well, thanks, yes. Uh, before we, we uh, have a conversation, Deborah, um, I think it's just worth saying uh, a few things about knowledge exchange, at least from the side of the research team. And what, what, have, we, what have we understood that perhaps we didn't understand before we started researching CEO? But one is uh, understanding much better the, um, the need for organizational survival and, and, and the complexity of trying to achieve that. Uh, a second, um, just in relation to the point that Jalicic was making about the, the landscape, is trying to understand how a body tries, tries to position itself in relation to a complex and changing landscape where resources are scarce and um, it's 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 a it's a continual negotiation. Um, we uh, we've also um, understood um, the difference between, if you like, 
holding formal events where we try to say, well, this is what we found out, what do you think? And the power of interactions as an informal way of achieving uh, knowledge exchange. Um, and then just very briefly, um, it's clear that uh, the impact agenda, which again, all British academics know about, um, has started to affect uh, research practice and has begun to change the, the normative ways in which academics think about themselves. And this, this is something that we've been thinking about in relation to this particular study, which uh, was not constructed to achieve an impact in that sort of way, but we can see that it does. And then finally, and, uh, and, and this comes very much out of the ethnographic mode, that we, because we've established so many relationships over such a long period, uh, we do feel that um, there are quite a lot of challenges um, to access. Access is a great thing to have, but it also imposes, um, if you like, a duty of care and, and respect for trust. Well, on that note, Deborah, <laughs> Let me uh, just uh, ask you, uh, why were you prepared to let CCPR come and research CEO? Okay. Um, so, I, I think having um, been operating in this fairly precarious landscape for about 10 years, um, and having built um, credibility with our client group, and certainly an empathy with our client group, and a year-on-year -year increase in demand for the work, there was still a kind of a, a real lack of understanding at stakeholder level, despite getting the money, what the real value of the work actually was. And I hadn't quite found the narrative, I think, to actually be able to present that. Um, and. And yet the money, you know, we still managed to get the money through and all the key stakeholders kind of knew it was good, but not really what was good about it or why. And we'd hit this really pivotal point in our organization. We were 10 years in and it was really a point to, I think, really consolidate and develop or consider doing the opposite of that. So it was definitely time for a real change. And I've been kind of toying with the usual economic development um, consultation evaluations, which, you know, and we'd had a couple of those done over the years, but they always, and though they kind of found some good things, they always felt like a bit of a drive-by shooting. And, um, you know, they'd leave and we'd get a report, and yet, actually, the real value of the work and why it's important and why it's important for the sector was never really caught. And, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, it never gave us a really useful argument to, to really start to um, inspire the policy makers that we're working quite closely with. So, so there was this sense that we needed something different. And I had a really inspiring conversation with a woman based in New Mexico in Santa Fe called Alice Loy, who does very similar work to us um, with cultural entrepreneurs. And we shared challenges around um, actually the difficulty of um, articulating success and defining success and communicating that. And she told me that they had commissioned an anthropologist to do their evaluation type work. So it kind of started that train of things going in my head. And I think about six months later, we met serendipitously. Um, but um, so, so I think we were, pr we were really seeking something different, um, if that answers the question. Yes, I, yeah. I think it does. Um, just moving on from that, I mean, when, when, when you agreed to let us tramp all over your office, yeah. um, you, had to, you had to sell this in, internally. And I think you know, mm -hmm. this could be a, a point of some interest for other researchers around about, well, how do you go about yeah. getting your staff on side and actually keeping them on side? 
I suppose it's to do with, I mean, the word trust I've heard lots of times already today, but it's the most important thing and nothing can be built without trust. And I think when I met with Philip and Mel, because they connected with the work so quickly and were so respectful about the work and who it's for, I think we very quickly built a trust. So I felt that we would be able to work together um, and go on a bit of a voyage of discovery. So I think feeling so confident myself about that, um, I was able to communicate it to the staff as though it was a bit of a gift to the organization. It was, you know, it was a moment where we needed this thorough, rigorous articulation of actually what we do and why. And, um, and so, and, and they'd heard me many times talk about those frustrations. So I think we were able to kind of share it as a bit of a gift, actually. So, but um, it did come at a point of a lot of change and development in the organization and you know we were undergoing a lot of restructuring and contract changes and lots of other things and there was a sense of change fatigue you know that had definitely started to creep in and in many ways I think it was this project um, that really helped everybody make meaning again out of you know what we're doing and why we're doing it. You know, everybody feels very passionately about their work and who they do it for. And this project kept all that very much to the fore while all the other stuff about change was, was ongoing. So um, in many ways, I, I, I don't think it was a hard sell. I think, you know, I said we, we had nothing to hide. Um, I, you know, nobody, no individuals were being scrutinized or reported on. Um, and I, th I think we were, we were able to kind of create that open environment, hopefully. It sounds like we did. <laughs> yeah, from my from point of view, I think you certainly did. Um, uh, what sort of um, impact do you think this has had on... CEO so far. And, I mean, of course, the process isn't quite over. No, but, it's uh, not. It's um, not. Um, yes, and we haven't seen the final paper yet. So, um, but I think it's been really quite profound, actually. And and for me, um, I mean, I'm quite a reflective kind of leader. So, for me, it's all the informal conversations that go round in my head, the um, the questions, the assumptions and the fact that no judgments were ever made by the researchers they 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 created a really safe space actually for everybody um, but they did ask very well judged questions I think you know the ones that have that really get you going and um, so I think it has had a profound impact and um, for me it has started to, I mean, from, I think I said to you last week, um, it's definitely allowed me as the director and the person responsible for organizations, organizational stability and, and building a viable future, it's allowed me to let some real elephants back into the room. The things that I just really wanted to, you know, things that didn't work and I wanted to get rid of. And it's allowed me to bring them in and actually talk about them and deal with them and, and reshape them and, um, and really start a kind of process of reframing our delivery model and and thinking about certain things that you just become attached to and, and maybe it's time to let those go. So that's, you know, that's incredibly empowering, actually. And I think you're, you're able to do that because of the way in which it's managed. It's because these people aren't doing a drive-by shooting. They're here with you for a year and we're all kind of exploring together. So, you know, so I think it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I think I'm still kind of peeling that onion back. But what's also interesting is, and, and is definitely beginning to emerge, is the difference that this articulation is having 
in terms of our key funders, the government, the stakeholders, and the kind of conversation that we're having now, which has come out of this research, just this process. Um, and they've been involved and they've been to some seminars. And it's definitely, it's definitely created a shift of a sort. So, um, yes. I wouldn't say it's kind of magically taken all the problems away. No. And, um, <laughs> but it's, it's created a space for a different conversation which is more confident. And, um, you know, and that thing about, well, what is it and why is it good, I think is starting to, to become more apparent. And that's incredibly... Uh, beneficial. Right. I'm conscious that we're probably getting to the end of our slot here. And uh, so, one last question really. Um, after, after a decent interval, Deborah, would you do it again? Would you let uh, another, <laughs> another crew in to uh, um, scrutinize you? And uh, of course, I, mean, I should say, I mean, we have written an interim report. We are going to report to you. Um, later in later in the summer, you know, just get, and and then of course there will be things that we write for academic purposes as well, and the you know if you like there are inside track things and there yeah. are, there are things for for the public domain, and that's certainly one of our dilemmas is you know precisely where do you draw the line? I think I think we're probably pretty clear about that in actual fact, but um, do you, do you, do you think that? Um, this, your account has been remarkably positive. Would you, would you, do you think there'd be another point at which you would welcome this sort of well, scrutiny? I, I think scrutiny is great. Mm. So yes, I, I would. I, I think, I, I don't think we need this particular type of scrutiny mm. again. But I think what I hope is that through this, we kind of build an understanding um, around the, the creative sector, which is broader than the one that exists at the moment, that world of the micro-businesses, where businesses choose to stay small, to sustain a creative life without building a growing business. And I think there are interesting knowledge exchanges to be had between agencies like ours and academia that I think can start to influence um, a way to create those kinds of conditions in the in the landscape. So yes, I think, but hopefully in a different way, in a way that moves us on. Well, th thanks, Deborah. I think we'll leave you with the last word. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming along. It's uh, and for sitting right, right the way through it. Actually, it's great. Thank you. Oh,